Okay, good afternoon, maybe morning, maybe it's nighttime where you are. Ellie in space here, and I am joined by Jean. You may recognize him. We've done a few live streams together now, and today we're going to talk about Chinese space because I think it's something a lot of us aren't aware of what's going on, but there's a lot going on. <laughs> and um, yeah, it, it 2023 was a crazy year for us in the US. It was also pretty crazy for China, including land space celebrating the first Methalox rocket to orbit. So something that they have claimed. Um, so how's it going? <laughs> It's going great. Thank you so much for having me, Ellie. I think this is the third time and it's uh, it's always a pleasure. Yeah, and we have a lot to talk about today, not just, you know, stuff that happened last year. We're almost to the end of January now, which is crazy in itself. Um, but let's start uh, wherever you'd like to start. If you want to start with the number of Chinese launches in 2023. Sure. That I think that's uh, that's quite nice. It can put all of the following discussions into some context. So China launched, uh, performed 67 orbital launches in, in 2023, um, 67 with 66 successes and one failure, I believe. And um, this this is a good figure for China. It's an unprecedented number of of launches. Their previous record was. 64 launches and that was in 2022 and that at the time was already breaking the previous record they've set this trend since the late 2010s of breaking their previous record year over year um and in the mid 2010s late 2010s they were launching 20 to 30 rockets uh, a year roughly today it's um literally double that number and so um, it's it's I mean, it's very significant for China. Now, if we put it a little bit into some some context now with the US, the US in the late 2010s was also very roughly lo launching the same number of launch vehicles, except today they are, I, I believe, uh, in 2023, nearly 100, um, 100 launches. So I say they because I I'm French and not American. That's why. Um, but you know, nearly 120 launches and there's one specificity with the US is that there is SpaceX that's been absolutely right. ramping up the launch of the Falcon 9 with the deployment of, of Star Starlink. And this is something that China does not have, or at least not for the not yet, not in the, for the coming one or two years. Right. Well, and if we look at, you know, SpaceX's 2023, they're basically doing the same thing, which is breaking their launch record over and over. Last year, if you count the two Starship launches, they had 98 total launches, which is so close to 100. But um, it sounds like China is is catching up. Absolutely. I, I mean, we're, I think we're the Chinese are gaining a, a couple of launches per year. And I think when they will start deploying their a satellite internet constellation, this was when we're going to see a significant ramp up. And um, beyond the constellation, it's also having the launch infrastructure to launch, uh, to have so many launches, because today with 67 launches, their four launch sites are extremely busy. Um, even if there was the request to launch uh, 120 launches, it could not happen today. And that is why they're building an additional launch site um, in, in Wenchang uh, on the island of Hainan, which should enter into service in, in mid-2024. And they're also developing sea launch in the northeast of, of China near the city of uh, Haiyang. Well, we know what Starlink is, everyone on my channel. So China Chinese space is trying to do something similar. Can you tell us about that satellite constellation? What's it called? Where are they at with their progress? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So Chinese satellite internet up to, let's say, late 2022, early 2023, was understood to be one project that's uh, known under the name of Guowang or Xingwang. And so this is a mega constellation that on paper should have up to 13,000 satellites. This is what we see on their ITU filing back in late 2020. Um, this constellation should be operated by a state-owned corporation that was uh, created in 2021 called China Satnet. China Satnet is short for China a Satellite Network uh, Limited, uh, based in, 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 in the south of Beijing. 
And um, up to up to now, there wasn't up to before 2023, there weren't any significant launches. And this is one change that we saw in 2023. There were a couple of of launches of small lift launch vehicles putting each time two or three uh, satellite internet satellites into orbit. These are very likely, you know, version 1.0 of those satellite internet um, um, satellites, uh, and, and very likely these will. Uh, evolve, they will be optimized, and then we should see a stronger deployment phase starting from 2024, but even more likely 2025. Okay. Well, and right, I mean, this is probably a no-brainer, but Starlink could never really be used in China, right? <laughs> yes, that's. Uh, I think that's also probably one of the advantages of, of the Chinese constellation is that um, they will have the monopoly um, within China. And right. um, there are also applications that probably will need to go over Chinese borders. This is where they they will have an advantage over Starlink. I'm thinking of, um, you know, maybe in-flight connectivity. You have a, a flight from Central Asia to, to the US, you're flying over China, or you're, you know, you're flying somewhere that flies over China. And um, this is where their constellation will have an advantage. But Obviously, they will probably not be able to operate over the U.S., so it goes both ways. Right. Interesting. Um, Ross wants to know, will Chinese satellite constellations be in similar altitude orbits to Starlink? Um, that's a good question. And then for, for that, we'd probably have to dig into the ITU filing. I, I don't know off the top of my head, um, but but possibly, yes. There actually There's actually more than one constellation. There are now potentially three. Um, so there's the one I, I mentioned, and this is the main state-backed constellation, okay? Uh, but starting in, in 2023, we started to see a second constellation called G60 that's pushed by the municipality of Shanghai. And we're looking at a constellation of a similar scale. Um, and there's potentially also a third one that's um, pushed forward by a commercial company this time called galaxy space because they filed also for a constellation a broadband constellation of 1800 satellites um, again in 2023 so we could see multiple mega constellations emerge um, we'll see if they actually all reach orbit and if they have the funding to go through but um, yeah th three constellations right um you know, we'll we'll get into some of the questions that we plan, but I don't know if you saw my video or, or are familiar with the former NASA administrator, Mike Griffin, kind of proposing that we should go back to an Apollo 2.0 for the Artemis plan. He essentially wants us to kind of have another race to the moon, um, fearing that, you know, if, if China gets there before us, that's going to be a major statement. On your side of things, you know, I mean, obviously, we went to the moon over 50 years ago. What do you think about, you know, who do you think will go to the moon first, who will win that race? And do you think that there's going to be a big difference between getting boots on the moon again versus a, a permanent presence? Um, I, I think, as you said, we've we've been on the moon before. And I think if if we're, we're to go again, I think what's more significant is to have a long-term presence rather than have a space race and have this title of having been first, having gone first in the, in the 2020s. And so um, the, the lunar missions that are going to take place in, in, in this decade between China and the US are, are very different. There's the Artemis three that's on a whole other scale compared to the Apollo era. And I think that's what's interesting. We're going towards um, you know, a new type of lunar exploration as opposed to China's mission in the late 2020s, which is very close to Apollo. When you look at the the mass of the spacecraft of the Chinese spacecraft that are going to land on the moon, it's very similar. The idea is to send three astronauts. One astronaut stays in orbit. Two other astronauts get into the lander. The lander lands. The astronauts stay a couple of hours. They go back up. They bring back samples. This is this is very close to Apollo. There's, there are some small nuances, but it's it's very similar. On the other hand, uh, the Artemis program is is doing something I think completely different, and the Chinese are only going. I mean, they're going to have something similar to Artemis called the ILRS, but only in the 2030s. So I think comparing Artemis in the 2020s with the Chinese program of the 2020s is, you know, it's a little bit apples and, and oranges. Right. Right. Definitely. Well. 
as we're in 2024, let's talk about some predictions that you have for this year. Sure. So, um, this, this goes back to the, your earlier hint about, about land space and, and all that. I think commercial launch is really growing massively in China. Um, so before 2024, let me just put a little bit of context around commercial launch in the past couple of years. Um, Chinese commercial launch is something that was enabled around 2014, 2015, thanks to some regulatory changes in China, which enabled commercial players to, to get into the space sector. And these commercial launch companies, they were launching, uh, the, the first successful launch was in 2019 of a very small solid field rocket. And between 2019 and 2022, they were, they were launching one, two, three, I mean, single digit uh, rockets. And in 2023, this is when we saw a much more significant number of commercial launch vehicles being launched, 17. That's I think that's around 20% of all the launches in 2023. Um, and in 2024, this is only going to grow further because more commercial companies are, um, you know, are coming of age, are performing their maiden launch, and they're scaling up their manufacturing capabilities. Uh, so I think we're going to see more than 20% of commercial launches. And it's also the nature of the launches because they're putting into service more sophisticated rockets. We're going to see newer, um, we're going to see liquid field rockets. Uh, and, and the first liquid field rockets uh, were in 2023. There was Land Space's Methlox field rocket. There was another one from Space Pioneer. Um, and in 2024, we're going to, going to see a couple of others, as well as some additional um, attempts towards reusability. So we're going to see um, some vertical takeoff, vertical landing hops. This already started in 2023, but we're going to see new companies do this. Landspace did this actually a couple of weeks ago. Yes, hold and on. Before we pull up that, I lost your video. Where'd you go? <laughs> oh, that's a good point. Let me turn off my camera and put it on again. <laughs> We can hear you. One second. Let me try and put it back on. Uh, start camera. How's this? Yes, that works. Okay. Yeah, that that might happen once or twice. Just let me know, and I'll I'll yeah, okay. start things. So, and so, yeah, in, in 2024, we're going to see um, companies like like Landspace a couple of weeks ago, Kasich actually today, and other other companies perform exactly what you're going to share here. Uh, more and more sophisticated hops of uh, these uh, single stage demonstrators, which are uh, are going to lead to the first actual orbital VTVL attempts uh, around 2025 and 2026 for, mo for most Chinese commercial companies. So, so what you're yeah, trying you're to be like a Falcon 9 or explain, you know, what this is trying to emulate? Oh, this, uh, I think it's very obvious. It's very similar to the Falcon 9. The idea is is to to take off and to land vertically, to use landing legs, to use grid fins. It's basically the, the approach of Chinese commercial companies today is most of them, not all, but really most of them is there's this fantastic example of SpaceX just um, nailing it with the Falcon 9. And their idea is not to reinvent the wheel, but to go for similar technical solutions. And so what you see here is a, is a small demonstrator using by, by land space. They're using their TQ-12 Methlox field engine that's powering the uh, Jutret-2, which launched last year, but that will also power their reusable rocket, the Jutret-3. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's just one step towards that objective. And so higher and higher hops, this was a very small one. I believe it just rose maybe 100 meters, something like that. But the next step is maybe a kilometer level hop. It's also maybe catching the rocket on a drone ship. It's um, doing basically what what SpaceX was doing in the um, in the early uh, in the early 2010s. I'm going to turn off the yeah, you know, camera again. He was playing games. Someone wants to know who is this fellow. Um, so you are one of the co-hosts of the Dongfeng Hour. Yes, yes, that's correct. It's a YouTube channel that we founded with uh, with a friend Blaine in in early 2020 because we had time on our hands with COVID. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's it's a channel talking about about Chinese space, um, and and in English. And now you're roped in. <laughs> yes, I, I'm trying to repair this. This is a oh, this you're is a fine. Mess. You're fine. Uh, no worries. We are well. You guys, I'll I'll. Oh, there we go. 
Oh, maybe not. Ugh. Well, I'll show you guys on full screen. I put some blue in my hair. It's actually taped in extensions, but that'd be kind of fun. So if you're, if you think you see blue in my hair, you do see blue in my hair. I got that done literally right before the live stream today. So uh, we will wait for the other <laughs> camera to come back. Maybe I will pop up that little hop again because that's kind of cool. Um, I think it's the camera overheating. Uh, oh, one, one moment. Do you have like a webcam? It's actually a regular camera, but I think the power system is, is, okay. is not great. Um, no worries. Let's see. There's got to be. What's another good video? Let's see. There, there, there's one from November also. It's iSpace attempting a similar thing, but with a, with a, um, a rocket with a, you know, a, a smaller thrust methlox fueled engine. Look, it's not really coming up. Uh, maybe we can continue the conversation. I mean, there's at least audio, and I'll try to repair this as we we talk. Yeah, well, here's the video of of the land space launch. So let's see if if we can see that here. Oh, I'm in the wrong land space methylox. Sorry, guys, bear with us. We're live, and stuff happens. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so let me play. So this is the video of the world's first orbital methane rocket launch. Man, relativity got so close. Uh, yes. Yeah, so yeah. All right. I'm back on. Hopefully. Oh, uh, are you? Oh, there you are. It's working. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, and, and so just to continue on the predictions for, for 2024, so there's there's um, these vertical takeoff, vertical landing attempts that are going to take place. Also something very significant in June, we're going to see the maiden launch of the Tianlong-3. So what on earth is the Tianlong-3? Tianlong-3 is uh, the medium lift liquid field, uh, Kerolox field rocket from the Chinese company Space Pioneer. And this is uh, a rocket that will have a payload capacity to low Earth orbit of 17 tons, if I remember correctly. And this is the first time that commercial companies are reaching the scale. This is a scale where, um, you know, these companies can start deploying um, satellite internet um, um, satellites in the satellite internet constellations of China. And this is where um, they these commercial companies will be able to play a bigger role in China's national space program. And so a huge step up normally in June 2024, if the launch goes forward um, for the commercial space sector. Wow. Um, and I know that we also wanted to discuss the Chinese equivalent of Starship, uh, which is the Long March 9 project. Okay, yeah, that's, uh, that's a whole other scale again. So, um, China has been looking to develop a super heavy lift launch vehicle um, since since the early 2010s for various reasons. I mean, this kind of launch vehicle can be very useful for um, missions towards Mars, also for long term missions towards the moon. If you want to put a lot of payload today, China's largest rocket is the Long March 5. This is something that's on the scale of a you know, a Delta IV heavy, an Atlas V, a Falcon 9. And so not that significant if you're trying to have um, something like the Artemis program or or even the Chinese, um, pro, I mean, they're, they're, they're Chinese, the Chinese equivalent of Apollo towards the end of the decade, the Long March 5 is, is too much of a, it doesn't put enough payload. Mm -hmm. And so um, there was this initial architecture in the 2010s that was using four uh, engines in a core stage and also some strap-on boosters using very heavy thrust Carolox fueled engines. This is a rather more traditional architecture. Uh, the rocket was entirely expendable. And then SpaceX came along and sort of um, brought a, a new, I'd say a new school of thought, a new philosophy for, for these kinds of super heavy lift rockets. And um, in the in the early 2020s, and especially in 2023, was revealed that China was going to change the Long March 9 architecture and go for something that's closer to um, to Starship. And so, closer to Starship, that means first of all, 
a um, couple of characteristics, moving from Carolox to Methalox, but I mean, a lot of launch companies are doing that. So, I mean, that's not specific to Starship, but it's also using lower thrust engines and many of them instead of a couple of super heavy lift, uh, super heavy thrust um, engines. It's also having um, a launch vehicle that's uh, reusable and fully reusable. So the Chinese are actually going to do that in two steps. Step one, around 2033, 2035, they're going for a semi, a partially reusable rocket. Only the first stage is reusable. And then uh, towards 2040, they're going for really a Starship architecture uh, where it's, you know, the, the second stage looks very much like what you're showing on the screen right now. There's a second stage that would uh, very likely, I mean, based on the geometry, do what, what SpaceX is doing now and, you know, the belly flop and all of that. Um, so that's that's for 2040. So it's we're talking about in in 15 years wow. because actually the Long March Nine is first of all they're they're starting from scratch. Their their previous architecture of the Long March Nine had gone quite far. Their the, those Carolox engines, the the YF-130 had gone pretty far in their development, but now they're starting from nearly from scratch, and um, and also it, it's not the priority because the bigger priority. I believe is the Long March 10, which is another rocket that is will will have the the goal of sending China's astronauts to the moon in the late uh, 2020s. And so, yeah, priority should be more on that. So, will will Long March 10 be similar to this kind of Starship equivalent, or is that a different? No, no, it, it's going to be a, a more a more traditional architect. It's, it's going to be something like a Falcon Heavy. So the idea is. The long-term objective is the Long March 9, and the shorter term, to, to have something that's uh, usable in, in, you know, in a couple of years, the idea is to have a more classical architecture. It's also to use uh, space hardware that's already existent, and so that's things like um, the, you know, the YF-100 Carolox engine that's already used on existing Chinese um, rockets. So it's to make that engine reusable, to enhance it, to, to, you know, to have some improvements and to use that kind of hardware to make uh, the Long March 10. So it's it's a rocket that will put 27 tons into translunar injection, around 70 tons into low Earth orbit. It's something that's really very close to to the Falcon uh, the Falcon Heavy. It's interesting that the Long March 9 they plan to use later, and then the Long March 10, which you know you'd think would be the opposite with the naming there. And there's the Long March 11 that's already in service since oh, the mid 2010s. Why is it all out of order? <laughs> I, I, because I think it's they give the number when they they have the idea of the rocket. And the Long March 9 is something that that was planned since the early 2010s, maybe. I, I don't know actually. It's it's it takes some mental effort to get all of those Chinese rockets in in your system. Right. Right. Well. We have other stuff to talk about, but I do want to hone in on the Chinese equivalent of Starship. I know that a lot of my subscribers are true fans of Starship, so I'm just going to rapid fire some questions that I'm seeing in the comments. These two are, are kind of similar. Keith writes, the rest of the space world should not underestimate Chinese drive, ingenuity, and ability to steal technology. Devin echoes this by saying they definitely know how to steal others' ideas. So what what is your reaction to kind of you know those yeah. type of comments so let's let's try to uh, i got a lot of those actually on my videos so, so let, let me try and explain why we have this 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 feeling and we don't have that with you know uh, other other countries and other projects first of all china's space industry is significantly uh separate from the rest of the world for for various reasons um uh, one of them is U.S. export restrictions that make it extremely difficult for Chinese, the Chinese to collaborate with other countries. And so the main market for a Chinese space company is their domestic market. And so when they're communicating, when a U.S. company is communicating, they're communicating to Americans, but actually to, to the whole world, because that's the market that they're going to be aiming for. The Chinese, on the other hand, their, their primary market is actually the domestic market. And so that sort of affects their way of, of communicating and saying that, um, you know, if I'm a Chinese company, I'm going to be the Chinese SpaceX, that has a good ring to it. That, that, that sounds like, okay, I'm going to become, I'm, I'm going to be on par with the international state of the art. And so that makes sense. Uh, whereas if 
if say a French company said, I'm going to be the, the French, the European SpaceX, it doesn't have the same ring to it. And it does have a little bit more of a copycat, um, a vibe. Um, and so that, that's why you don't really hear that that much. Um, but it, it, I think in the, in Chinese, in the communication of Chinese companies, it's a little bit, it's also a type of flattery. It's, it's really, uh, it's also recognizing that SpaceX is, is leading the space sector and that's what they want to reach. That's their target. So I think that's, that's one reason. Another reason is also, I think that a lot of these commercial companies don't necessarily have a very good marketing practice. I'm, I'm sorry for my camera. I, I see it flashing. I'm, I apologize. Like, What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah, let me see if I can do something. But yeah, it, they also some of them, you know, they're they're startups. They don't have a lot of funding. They don't put a lot into marketing, and some of them really have shown horrible marketing practices. Uh, there's this company, and I believe it's in in Shanghai that sort of copied uh, a SpaceX logo um, there. And also their, maybe their, their marketing, you know, the, the role for the role of the marketing company and the startup early on is to raise money, right. From, from their investors. And so saying that they're going to do something close to the Falcon nine, something that's working extremely well is reassuring for the investor. And so that's why it's uh, you see that kind of, 3D mockups that just basically copy US designs, not just the Falcon 9. We've seen that with uh, Blue Origins, um, you know, New Shepard. We, we've seen with Cast Space, but that doesn't mean that in the end that's what the the rocket is going to to look like. I think one good example is is um, Space Pioneer, the, the their first their Tianlong two rocket that they launched last year. If you look at their CGI designs from a couple of years ago, it looks like a Falcon 9. In the end, last year, the rocket they launched was extremely different. It was expendable. It was not reusable. It did not have a lot of the features that showed on the CGI mock-up. So um, yeah, that's a couple of reasons. Uh, but yeah, uh, well, I hope that makes sense. Anytime we chat, I have to say there are a lot of people that are just negative on China and they just don't even want to hear about it. And, you know, you can have your opinion either way, but I think it's important we at, le at least know what's going on, uh, whether you are a fan or not. Um, but sorry for the negativity. I do appreciate you updating us. Here are some similar questions. One of them, Gregory says, how does the average Chinese citizen view China's space program? Does the person on the street support it or is it mainly driven by high level party officials? And Ross echoes this saying, how does interest in space flight in China compare to interest in the West? Does the relative lack of transparency in China affect enthusiasm? So that's a very good question. And I've asked myself that question. I think there are two angles to this. Uh, let's say I'm I'm a Chinese young graduate, or I'm I'm you know I just graduated from high school. I'm going to university, and I'm wondering what uh, what industry I can work in. I, I'm excluding those that are passionate about space because those will naturally gravitate towards those those I mean the space industry, but others the space industry even today is mostly concentrated within a handful of massive Chinese state-owned space conglomerates. And state-owned companies, they do offer the safety of, of your employment, but they don't pay very well. And so um, it's, I don't think it's, it's that attractive as a job, but I mean, I don't live in China. I'm not Chinese. So uh, maybe there's, maybe that, you know, it's, it's just my, my personal opinion. I don't think it's that attractive as, um, as, a, as an industry in terms of, of, of pay. Uh, on the other hand, uh, something that would suggest a very strong popularity of the space industry and the space sector and China's space program in China is when you look at the videos of Wen Chong during the launches of the Long March 5 and Long March 7s and the Long March 8s. So Wen Chong is, is their latest launch pad that was built uh, during the last decade. It's, it's the launch pad that's the most um, accessible. It's the one that launches the largest rockets and all the high profile Mars and lunar missions and, and space station missions. And the place is packed. I, I read a figure that for the, the launch of the one tin experimental uh, module of the space station in, in 2022, there were 500,000 people that gathered to watch that launch that, um, so that, that sounds pretty insane. And that does suggest 
growing popularity as China's space program, um, you know, gains momentum and is becomes, com you know, more and more comparable to uh, what what NASA could be doing um, on the moon for Mars and, and uh, in other places in the solar system. Well, the inverse of Jeff Bezos, Beth Bezos wants to know, do they have an equivalent <laughs> of Elon Musk in China? Interestingly, no, because um, sp I think space remains a quite strongly regulated uh, sector in China. And I think there's also a lot of uncertainty on what can be done and what can't be done. What should stay within the scope of the government and state-owned companies? What can be done uh, by commercial companies, even though there have been regulations that made this more and more clear? And so... If you're a billionaire in China and you want to invest your money, uh, you tend to be a little bit more cautious. And to put it, I mean, that's my again, that's my opinion. But to put it in sectors that are widely accepted as you know open to private and to commercial initiatives, and so it'd be other tech sectors rather than space. There aren't any um, billionaires that are really pouring their money as SpaceX is as as Elon Musk is doing or Jeff Bezos. Um, you do have some high profile people like the CEO of Xiaomi that is um, that's pushing forward the space sector. He has um, an investment fund that's called Shunwei Capital and that's invested into a lot of commercial companies. But I mean, nothing on the scale of an Elon Musk uh, for, for the reasons that I mentioned. I think in the US, when there is no regulation, then your maybe your reflex is there's no law, there's no rule, then it's probably authorized. I'm going to go for it. On the other hand, in China, you, you tend to be a little bit more cautious when, when you're in that situation. Right. Um, and this might, I think this would probably be a no, but Gregory wants to know, is it possible that SpaceX could build a Starship factory in China since Tesla has factories in China? It is interesting to see, you know, the relationship between Tesla and China, but just how the space industry is like so different. So, um, Short answer is absolutely not. I, I don't. Okay, I'm gonna just turn off my camera again. Turn it back on. So the answer is is no because space. I mean, Elon Musk and and Tesla. I mean, Elon is Tesla building a a super factory in Shanghai. The reason is because it is serving the Chinese market. Okay, there's a huge market for Tesla in China. On the other hand, there's no market for SpaceX in China. Just due to um just to the various regulations and export restrictions that the us has applied uh, uh in the space industry there is no chance that uh, china launches its uh national space program payloads on i mean on, on spacex rockets that's just i mean we're talking about critical infrastructure uh we're talking about the space industry there is no way that uh, there can be collaboration in space as you see it today um, in, in the automobile industry. Um, right. Unfortunately, in my opinion, but yeah. Well, Barney wants to know, has China announced what crew number their copied Starship will carry to the moon? <laughs> um, so the Long March 9, the ultimate version, no. Um, this rocket, based on the figures that were announced in 2023, would put 80 tons into low Earth orbit. That's its payload capacity, as opposed to I think around 150 for um, for Starship. So it's it's not as uh, powerful, not as capable as as Starship. So if we want very broad figures, I suppose we could take whatever SpaceX says and divide that by two, since the payload capacity is also divided by two. Okay, interesting. We have some comments that I just <laughs> uh, dad jokes, rad jokes says juicy talk. Glad to be here, but uh, deviated. Dave says, does he not want to be seen answering China questions? It amazes me, like the hate of just even this conversation. So uh, I can't imagine what you get on your channel. Is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> you know, I I I, I read um. I read one of your comments on Twitter not so long about go about saying um, I should follow my own advice and stop reading my comments. I yes. do get sometimes similar thoughts just because of of the hate. And so there you go. We're in in a similar situation. It's so rough. Um, but I honestly I think there is a component of kind of being addicted to reading the comments, too. 
Um, well, Ross has a really great question, and I've talked about this several times with Jonathan McDowell, one of our favorite resident astronomers. Um, and this this has been a problem, and it kind of seems like the Chinese attitude toward it is not great. So what is China's latest attitude to responsible disposal of second stages in orbit to reduce space junk, which is an ever increasing problem? Yes. So uh, China does have a very bad practice with its Long March 5B. I mean, uncontrolled reentry is something that still happens today. It's just that it doesn't People don't do it with so big pieces of, of space hardware. So, I mean, everyone does some form of uncontrolled reentry, not just one that's as dangerous as the Long March 5B, although the chances are, you know, one in a thousand. So maybe you'd consider that little. That's still pretty big um, yeah. compared to what other rockets are, uh, other threats from other rockets. Right. Um, and the reason, I mean... It's wrong to say that China doesn't care about uh, about this risk. I just think that this risk wasn't taken into account back in the day when the Long March 5 series was being developed. We're talking about the early 2000s. Um, it's much more of a discussion today, especially with the high frequency launches that we see in the space industry. You know, launching a risky rocket once that has one chance out of 1,000, 1, if you launch it once, then it's one in 1,000. However, if you launch it 10 times, 100 times, then the risk, the total risk becomes, you know, it adds up. And so I think the Chinese are much more conscious conscious of, of um, you know, taking care of, of, of the debris and deorbiting and uh, do, performing a controlled reentry. It's just that um, it, the Long March 5B is, is you know, it, it was designed a long time ago. However, we've seen uh, since then a number of standards uh, that, are, that are being published and that you know, I believe there was one, if I remember correctly, in 2019 that was that's that regulates what commercial companies have to do with um, their upper stages. It needs to perform a controlled reentry at the end of the lifespan of of a commercial satellite. It needs to either go into a graveyard orbit or deorbit safely. Uh, if you're releasing um, um, fuel um, and propellant out of your spacecraft, how to do it? So there are new regulations, and so it's just yeah. There's there's um, there's this very bad example of the Long March 5B, and people also have the images very likely of some of the um, um, stages of the older Long March rockets, which fall on land in China, and that again is for histor historical reasons. The older launch sites were built in land, and this leads to the situation they are in today, and they're they're hoping to get rid of, but they're they're still stuck with uh, for a couple of years at least. Right. Okay. It's a good answer. Um, and someone, I know that you've already kind of said you're with the Dong Feng Hour, but he wants to know where you're from. To be clear, you're not in China right now. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm in I'm in Paris. I'm in France, and uh, it's been uh, I've been in France for a couple of years now. I was based in um, in China in the late 2010s, and where I was following the Chinese space sector, and I've always been a space enthusiast, and I'm just sharing my knowledge on, on the Chinese space sector on a YouTube channel. I'm um, similar to to what you're doing, Ellie, and you know, the everyday everyday astronauts and the all of these space enthusiasts that are making a hobby out of uh, out of their passion for space. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, Gregory makes a good point. Why has NASA been willing to work in close partnership with the Russians? Well, maybe not anymore, but has completely shut off all collaboration with Chinese in space. So that's that's a fantastic question. I think one of the reasons is that it's not NASA that doesn't want to. I think Bill Nelson is pretty anti-China, but if you look at the previous uh, administrators of of, of, of NASA, um, several of them have been have shown hints of being open to to some form of collaboration with China. It's just that ever since 2011 and the Wolf Amendment. You need to have very specific authorizations from Congress to uh, for, for NASA to have any contact with with China. And so I don't think it's NASA that doesn't want to. It's just that the mood uh, in, in U.S. Congress today is 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 pretty anti-China. And so I NASA can't work with China today, as, except for maybe some very specific missions. And I and I don't see that getting better 
I, I see that staying the same in, in the coming years, especially based on the comments that we heard Bill Nelson have um, make, you know, last year. Well, we keep getting, you know, negative comments about China is full of lies, can't be trusted. If for some reason, I mean, do you think that it's worth us trying to work with them? Or like from your perspective, is there some truth to that um, claim that keeps being made? I think that it would be pretty awful if, um, because the moon is is one of the big objectives of, of the 2020s and 2030s, if we start having borders on the moon. I think that would be an, an absolutely horrifying idea. And so I, I think that there are a lot of areas in space where there's room for collaboration. I don't think that the US and China should collaborate in the design of maybe, a, you know, spy satellites or I don't know, space planes or things that can have military applications. But I think for, there are a lot of areas and if you take the the correct, you know, the, the relevant pr precautions, there are ways to do things safely and to collaborate in space as uh, Europe has been doing. I think Europe has been doing a relatively good job of this where, uh, for example, in the, in the Chang upcoming Chang'e 6 mission, um, lunar mission that, that's going to launch in May this year, uh, China will be carrying some instruments from Italy, from France, um, and I, I think that's a good thing. Um, and I, I don't think that poses a risk um, for, for, yeah, for, for the U.S. So hopefully they can move in this direction. But again, Congress is is the main obstacle here. But do you think, and sorry to like lay the heat on you, but you know, it's just this sentiment that China will not cooperate for you know future plans on the moon. Is there any truth to this? I think that on the contrary, they're really looking to make their their current lunar program international. I mean, it's it's a China-led program, so they will always want to make the main systems. They will want to keep the lead, but they're really looking to have other countries join. So they they created something last year called the ILRS CO. So ILRS is their the name of their lunar pro program in the 2030s, the International Lunar uh, Research Station. It's actually Sino-Russian, if we're to be exact. Um, and the, the ILRSCO, the cooperation organization, the idea is to have a lot of countries sign on. And so far, the countries that signed on last year, they're, they're the usual suspects, close allies of, of China and um, Russia. So you're going to have uh, uh, Pakistan, uh, Azerbaijan, Venezuela, uh, Belarus. Um, but there's also some non-aligned countries like Egypt. Egypt signed on to the LRS and South, South Africa. These countries also have, um, so, I mean, Egypt, for example, has strong uh, strong relationship with Western countries. I think China wants to attract more of these countries, uh, th these kinds of, these kind of um, non-aligned countries uh, in the Middle East, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, these are likely targets. And I think they'd be very happy also to have Western countries on board. There was, uh, I think it's the Lunar Observatory Association based in Hawaii that signed on to the ILRS. It's not exactly a country, it's an association. Um, we know that also there's there's the Swiss company, Nanospace, that signed on to, to play some role. And... Um, um, I'm trying to think. We know that the CEO of Talus China, so Talus, a European company, also um, met with the DSEL, the Deep Space Exploration Laboratory in China, which manages, uh, among other things, the LRS. And so I think they're very open to having Western countries on board. Um, it's just, yeah, there, I think the main problem is there's a lack of trust today yeah. that is... Um, and I actually, I think the main hurdle is not really China on the ILRS. It, it's, it's actually that it's a Sino-Russian program. And, uh, you know, ever since the invasion of Russia, of, 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 of Russia, of Ukraine, well, um, that's, that's, yeah, that's, I think that's making it a no-go for uh, the ILRS for a lot of Western countries. And it's funny because in some of the marketing material that China is handing around of the ILRS, they actually uh, erased the Russian rockets. Um, oh to hide the, the Russian presence because it is it, it is scaring Western countries away. And I think the fact that they're doing that highlights that they do want to have Western countries work with them. Um, right. Yeah. But you did make one point, if I heard you correctly, 
as long as they're in the lead. Is that what you said? I, I, that's, that's a personal opinion. Um, okay. I, let me give you an example. Um, for the Chinese space station, now the Chinese space station is fully assembled. There are three, uh, there are three modules. There's a core module. There's two experimental modules. They're going to add a fourth module in the coming years, and uh, coming years. And um, some of the statements last year from 2023 um, from the from CMSA, the China Manned Space Agency, um, said that they were open to have an entirely foreign design module dock onto it. And so, again, this is clear and very in-depth collaboration. But at the same time, you're you know you're having one foreign module onto docked onto a fully Chinese space station, and that's I think that's the model they're looking for. Um, rather than having uh, you know international partners join in at the very beginning at the in the design phase of the you know the three module Chinese space station, so that's what we're we're that's what we're seeing with the CSS. That's likely what we're going to have with the ILRS. Um, personal opinion again, but um, yeah. No, we appreciate that's why that's why I'm asking you. I feel like I'm grilling you more more this time, but I appreciate you answering <laughs> your questions. That's fine. Um, and we have a very generous super chat from Bimmer Gazer. Thank you for tuning in. Glad to have you back with us, Jean. He wants to know if the Chinese private space companies are really private. Um, okay, great question. I get that question a lot as well. Uh, it's hard to put all the Chinese companies in the same basket. So commercial has a very broad meaning in China. It can just very in, in its broadest sense, it just means that these Chinese. Um, so I, I, I focus a lot on launch. So launch comes to comes to mind. It means that uh, so a private launch, a commercial launch company would mean that it is looking for commercial contracts. It is looking for contracts to to make money. Uh, but it doesn't say that it's it's private capital. Uh, so, um, yeah, commercial is a very broad term. Uh, and you'll have spinoffs of Kasich. Kasich is uh, China's largest state, uh, one of the China's largest state conglomerate that's involved in space. Their uh, spinoff called X-Space, um, they're considered commercial space, although they're linked to a state-owned company. You see, that's it's not private at all. On the other hand, you'll have the complete opposite. You'll have companies like Land Space. You'll have companies like uh, potentially Galactic Energy um, that have a lot of funding that's coming from private venture capital firms that invest in tech companies. Um, and you know, I mentioned Shunwei Capital uh, previously. That's that that's linked to Xiaomi. Um, they'll have this kind of of investor for a big part. And then you'll have also a lot of companies that are in between. There are companies that have a mix of investors. You'll have um, private investors. You'll have um, state-sponsored investors. Uh, nobly, you'll have provincial uh, VC firms. So it's when a province province wants to encourage high-tech firms to um, set up, uh, you know, set up uh, facilities on their territory, they'll invest in them. Uh, you also have universities that can have their own VC firm, VC branch. And so um, it's uh, it really depends on the company. And there's a wide spectrum of so-called commercial companies, some that would fit in the definition of private and others um, probably not. Gotcha. Man, that camera is really giving you issues. Yeah, I'm very sorry. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry for you. I'd be super stressed out if I were in that boat. We have another super chat from Michael Maxey. Thank you for the super chat. He wants to know, will China be expanding launches offshore with more for floating platforms or artificial islands? That's a very good question as well. And they illustrated this actually a couple of weeks ago. Um, with the launch of the Gravity One, uh, which was a sea-based launch, uh, it launched off the um, a ship called the uh, um, the or Oriental Spaceport. Um, and so, yes, definitely. And to put this into a little bit of, of of context, once again, China's main launch sites are situated inland: Zhoutian, Taiyuan, and Xichang. And there's only Wenchang. Uh, that's situated on the island of Hainan. That's a coastal launch site. And uh, and that doesn't have, at least for now, a very um, high launch uh, capacity. And so 
if you're launching from some of the inland landlocked launch sites, then you're limited in the azimuth you can launch in because um, since you're launching inland, your booster is going to hit Chinese territory. And so you can only launch so that these boosters uh, fall on, on mountains, on forests, on, on non-inhabited areas. Um, and that's a limitation because maybe you want to launch in an orbit that would result in the booster falling over a city. And so if you want to do that, you, you still have to launch in a non-ideal azimuth, and then you have to do a correction once in orbit. And so that that impacts either the you know the lifespan of of the satellite or uh, the payload capacity of the rocket. And so that's not ideal. And so launching from the sea is something that solves this problem that is quite unique to China since, most launch sites around the world are are coastal. Um, and so definitely they're doing that. There are also other advantages of launching from the sea because, um, and this is something that I discussed in my most recent video, um, if you're you're launching into a polar orbit, it's nice if you're at a quite, a quite high latitude because you don't want that um, effect of the Earth's rotation. But on the contrary, if you're launching to geostationary, orbits, it's quite nice to be near the equator. And so launching from a ship gives you the flexibility of choosing where you want to launch from. And there are also negative negatives with sea launch. Uh, one of them is that there's quite heavy upfront infrastructure to set up. But this is where the government of Haiyang, the local government of the city of Haiyang, is um, sort of offsetting this by um, investing heavily in this sea launch infrastructure. It's it's not just Haiyang, it's also the province of Shandong that's investing into this sea launch infrastructure in, in the northeast of China. Oh, well, that was a really good question. Thank you, Michael. Um, and Gregory wants to know, and this is something I saw that you put in your notes about deep space missions, asteroid sample return. So Gregory wants to know, considering China's territorial expansion in the South China Sea and gaining sole access to raw materials in Africa, when they get to the moon, will China claim territory and exclusive mineral rights? Uh, that's, uh, that's, I, that's the position of, of Bill Nelson. That's what he said last year. He said that um, China has its territorial claims in, in the South China Sea. And he believes that based on that, China could also do the same on the lunar surface. Um, uh, hard to say. I, I I don't really have an opinion on this, and I I don't really want to have an opinion because I have I have U.S. and I have Chinese viewers, and that, that's too much making a political statement. So I, I want to focus a little bit on, more on the space part, but um, that is definitely something that Bill Nelson is is worried about. That that's his standpoint, um, and um, and I suppose that personal opinion again. Being involved to some extent enables you to have more control on what is going to happen rather than segregating entirely your, your, your space programs, in which case I think you're also I, I think that is also pushing the establishment of borders on, on the lunar surface. Again, personal opinion. Right. Well, my followers woke up ready to choose violence today. No, we appreciate <laughs> no your worries. questions. We appreciate you answering them. Um, Ross wants to know, as well as Sten, uh, what are China's longer term plans for Mars? Or is there a Chinese human mission to Mars in the works? Um, there are a lot of plans in academic papers of uh, you know, massive sort of shuttle uh, spacecraft that would go between Mars and the Earth. These are this is still academic. And so um, setting those aside, if we're talking about more tangible projects, um, it's it's going to be the Tianwen-3 mission. This is something that will take place at the end of this decade. And this is a Mars sample return mission. Okay. There are a lot of similarities with what NASA is doing currently with Perseverance, collecting samples and leaving them around on the Martian surface for future uh, European and, and American missions to go capture and return to the Earth. So China has something similar. This will be, uh, I think this will be a, a very big technological achievement for both the US, Europe, and China because this is something that's never been achieved before, Mars sample return. But China has a slightly different approach where they're going for, and you know, this is maybe similar to, you know, they're, they're, they're step-by-step -step approach they have for the moon. They have the same for Mars where their Mars sample collect um, 
mission is is much more simple. It's um, it still remains very complex, but it's more simple in the sense that um, it's going to be um, it's going to be there is only going to be two launches involved. They're going to land a lander on the Martian surface. That Martian surface that that lander is going to drill, is going to collect samples, mm -hmm. and is going to return them uh, to the Earth. The difference with the U.S. is that the U.S has a more sophisticated mission profile where there's a rover that's going to several places and that's collecting you know samples uh, that have different levels of interest that have a different geological background and so there will be different samples in a single um, you know that'll be brought back as opposed to China where everything will be coming from one place and I think that is the big that's the main objective of uh, in, in the 2020s and if if you know, if China and the U.S. are to move to larger scale missions uh, to Mars, they will need very likely more powerful rockets. And on the Chinese side, that means either the Long March 10, which is a sort of Falcon Heavy, and we're talking about the 2030s in that case, or the Long March 9. In that case, we're talking about the late 2030s or the 2040s. And the plans for Mars around those dates um, aren't, aren't that, I mean, the, the plans for, yeah, the the missions that are going to take place at that time are not clear uh, at this moment. Good answer again. <laughs> and uh, people are chiming in on the comments saying that we are both maintaining our neutrality. So you're doing fine. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, do you, you speak Mandarin, right? Yes, I speak Mandarin. I, um, I, 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 I spent a lot of time learning it. I also spent a couple of years in China learning it and that, I don't speak perfect Mandarin by all means, but um, I, can, I can read Chinese. I can listen to their live streams and understand what's going on. And uh, that that helps definitely to, to understand. I love hearing different languages. So will you just describe to me Starship in Mandarin and then French? <laughs> well, I, I think that will be a little bit complicated for me in, in Mandarin. Um, but um, you're putting me on the spot here. <laughs> <laughs> I did this last year at AIAA. There was, I think it was uh, someone else who speaks French. And I asked them to like, explain things in French and they did not want to. They got so nervous. So I guess this is like <laughs> a scary thing. Yeah, <laughs> I'm getting a little bit nervous. Here. Pass on that one, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Always fun coming to my live streams. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that's so funny. Uh, well, Ross, thank you for the super chat. Well done, Ellie, for periodically covering Chinese space flight with Dong Feng Hour. It's important to keep in touch with what's happening with the world's second biggest country in terms of launches. I agree. Oh, absolutely. And I think it's... Um... It's a pity that there's there isn't that much interest for for Chinese space flight. I think half the responsibility is also on on the Chinese. I don't think they communicate that well to an international audience. They they do communicate for a domestic audience, um, but since the Chinese tech ecosystem is very separate because they don't use Twitter, they use um, you know they use they use Weibo. They don't they have their own application ecosystem and so um, we don't necessarily get their their communication but it's also it's surprising that there's there's not that much interest for what is basically the second um, space superpower and the second space program in terms of size and in terms of budget and um, and yeah I think that's what Dongfeng hour is for is really to cover this gap in English and to provide an independent coverage um, from just space enthusiasts. Yeah, it's surprising to me the lack of of interest too. And I feel like it's just because there's this kind of prejudice or preconceived, you know, opinions about just China as a whole. So um, let's see, this viewer wants to know, how do the Chinese view the American moon landing? Or do you know? Um, so there's I think most space enthusiasts, Chinese space enthusiasts that uh, I follow, um, I mean, you do get uh, part of them that are extremely nationalistic and that are always having, you know, having some negative comments on on U.S. Um, missions and, you know, whenever there's maybe a failure, they're, they're going to. But I think most Chinese space enthusiasts, they're extremely 
they admire the, the US space program and the ambition of the upcoming Artemis 3, Artemis 4, Artemis 5, and all the others. And they, they understand that the US has been leading the way in the commercialization of, of, of space. And um, they recognize that SpaceX, so far is the state of the art, and it's not just the public, it's also when you look at what, what commercial companies are saying, this is something that's recognized by land space, by, by deep blue aerospace, all these Chinese companies. And so they, they view, actually it's, in, it's interesting how the Chinese view the US more positively than a lot of US space enthusiasts view um, China. Now, that's all, always a generalization. Um, you, you have a bit of everything when you, you look closely. Right. Yeah. Well, we have another super chat from Crunch to Grace Hopper. Free world abandoning well optimized plan shows the weakness of West administrators facing China paper. Mm -hmm. Tiger meows go SpaceX. I'm not sure exactly what all of that means, but thank you for the super chat. <laughs> um, let's see. So let, let me go back to our notes and see. I don't think we've missed anything unless there's something that, oh, the Chinese space plane. Although you say there's very little info available on this topic. Yes. Yeah, so uh, you're going to be disappointed in the answer. There's there's very little information. Um, China basically announces that they launched the space plane and th that's all we get. Uh, but I can give some context that's always interesting. I well, think. And, yeah. and I know a little bit about this just because I recently covered the X-37B. It was delayed. So we were supposed to launch before China, if I remember correctly. And then we were delayed. Um, and so we launched after my understanding from doing a little bit of research, they're pretty similar in size. Uh, absolutely. So yeah. from China, we, we don't really know anything from, from their communication. Now, what we do know is that it's, it's launching on a long March 2F. And so we know the payload capacity of a long March 2F. And so we can guess, Hey, the space plane is going to be around eight tons or, or you know, 8.5 tons tops. Um, we also know the diameter of the payload of, of the fairing, and there was a picture of the fairing with a lot with uh, some bumps. So we uh, to to give more space to what presumably would be wings, and so we can guess that the wingspan is larger than uh, the, the diameter of the fairing. So it's maybe slightly more than 4.2 meters. Um, but beyond that, beyond this guesswork, then we have to rely on either say the U.S. Space Force that's tracking. Uh, space objects and that can see what kind of maneuver um, that the space plane is doing, or you have to rely on uh, amateur radio astronomers that will see that, hey, um, the space plane is emitting in this frequency, what, you know, and it's guesswork on what could that be for. Um, but let me, let me put this specific space plane into uh, some context. This is a second stage space plane. Because space plane can meet a lot of things. This is a second stage space plane. So it's launched by a regular rocket, or it's, it's um, it, by a regular rocket, and then it's um, you know, it's it's in orbit, and then it when it re-enters, it can land horizontally. Uh, but China is also developing a first stage space plane, so it's separate from what was launched um, last month. And this is this is similarly some something similar to DARPA's XS1 that was abandoned. I think it was one or two years ago. Um, and this is a so it's a rocket that it's it's a first stage that will land vertically like any rocket. But once there's stage separation, then that stage instead of landing vertically like SpaceX, it would land horizontally like like a plane, like a space plane. Okay. And the idea very likely is that at some point, these two projects are going to be merged into, could be merged into one project where you have a, you know, a two stage uh, space plane where both um, stages are reusable and both of them land horizontally. And I think China overall is is a lot more interested in the space plane concept and uh, believing in the space plane concept compared to other other countries. In the 70s and the 80s, there was a space plane craze, which led to the space shuttle, it led to Buran, it led to Europe also having its own dreams for a space plane. It was called Hermes at the time, Japan, the UK, everyone had their own space plane project. And then uh, because of likely the Columbia disaster and other economic reasons, um, space planes just lost traction. And you do have some ex ex exceptions like um, 
like the, the Dream Chaser from Seer Space, like Skyline uh, in the UK. But overall, sp there, there isn't this space plane craze anymore, except in China, where they seem to still strongly believe in this concept. So there's um, there's Cask, which is developing the two space planes that we mentioned previously. There's also the other big state conglomerate involved in space called Kasik, and they're developing a project called Tengyun. It's also a two-stage to orbit space plane. Both stages land horizontally, so that's a similarity with the other space plane. But this space plane lands, uh, this space plane takes off horizontally like a plane as well. And so this implies developing specific propulsion technologies like like combined cycle engines and, and things like that. And so there are quite a few space plane projects underway hmm. in China, most of them shrouded in secrecy. Um, but yeah, in, in a nutshell, hope that helps. Which is not surprising. Keith, thank you for the super chat. He's really enjoying this interview. Great topic, lots of perspectives. The space race is in full swing. I would agree with that. And two of our viewers just brought up something which I should have had on my notes to question you about. Um, but this idea that China is not in the Artemis Accords, the Artemis Accords uh, cooperation in the civil exploration and use of the moon, Mars, comets, and asteroids for peaceful purposes. Russia and China would not sign. Red flag? So, yeah. Uh, good, good question. I think that... Um... So I, I think Russia's position is that it's um, what they say is that it's too U.S. centric. I, I don't know what that means because I haven't dived too deep into the Artemis Accords. Um, and I, I, I and it goes back to what I said just now is that I don't think necessarily it's that much the content of the Accords um, that is stopping say, China from signing them. It's more the the fact that it's it's U.S. led, and that's that's I think China's a little bit allergic to that, um, and and they don't want to be too deep into a U.S. led project. I think just similarly, like like the U.S. probably doesn't want to be in a China led um, project, and I think it goes it boils down to the lack of trust. Right. So I don't necessarily the the content of these accords, which I'm not that familiar with, right. but it's, it's more the, the problem of, of trust. Um, Man, we got to heal this trust. <laughs> you and me will, 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 will lead an effort. No, I'm kidding. It, it is, it is, <laughs> it is unfortunate. You know, it is unfortunate. And everyone, let's just remind you that, you know, don't attack the messenger. Uh, you are doing a great job informing us of what's going on with the Chinese space industry. Nukin appreciates the Chinese space effort. He finds it awesome. It does suck that it's not shared much. They do want to be powerful and glorified as first or best. They take it seriously. Um, and they're doing a lot of important things right now. So I think it's good that we tune in. Um, and I think it's a message of peace. Um, if we see a Chinese astronaut on the ISS or, uh, you know, an American astronaut on the CSS, I think that's a real message of peace. I don't think it's going to stop any wars, as we've seen um, with the invasion of, of Ukraine by Russia. But I think it's it's still a step in the good direction. And it, it does, you know, it, it ensures that channels are established and that communications are, are there. So um, hopefully, yeah, think, you know, collaboration can can get better than the rock bottom level that it is at right now. Absolutely. Well, Gregory is congratulating me on 82,000 plus subscribers. So thank you for that. And I'm going to leave your most popular video in the chat. It looks like you are almost to 30,000 subscribers, which is awesome. So if you guys want to watch the Dongfeng Hours most popular video, this Chinese startup just landed a rocket vertically. So if that doesn't catch your attention, I don't know what will, but I have left your channel in the comments and there was another comment in the beginning of the chat. I'm just trying to find it. So Gregory pointed out earlier, and I want to see if you agree with this. If it wasn't for SpaceX, the U.S. space program would be behind China. So it depends on how we define behind China. If we took a very simple metric that doesn't necessarily mean anything, but it's, you know, it's what it is. If you take the number of launches, you take out Starlink, then... China has more launches, and that's without having their own Starlink program. Um, so to some extent, yes. But when you look at the, the 
intensity of of the U.S.'s and NASA's space exploration program and and um, and Artemis. And I mean, SpaceX was selected for the HLS, uh, for example. Um, Starship was selected, but if if it, if SpaceX wasn't there, it would probably have been another company. And so SpaceX is not necessarily irreplaceable. It's just that on a certain metrics, it definitely would have would put the U.S. back on. Yeah. I wonder if he meant would be behind China as in support their program more. Support their program. Oh, behind. Hmm. I, I think that's how I took it. I don't know. <laughs> I I don't I don't think there's a there's a direct link because no, okay. SpaceX or no SpaceX, it's it's Congress that's blocking any collaboration with with China. Yeah. Yeah, I had forgotten about that Wolf Amendment. Um, let's see. So let's see. Am I missing anything? By the way, if you guys want to subscribe and get more information, here is at Dong Dongfang Hour. I feel like I always say it wrong. Dongfang Hour. No, that's that's fine. Dongfang Hour. Yeah, uh, in Chinese, yeah, it's Fang rather than Fang, but I'm fine with Dongfang Hour as well. Dong Fang. Yeah, exactly. Very nice. It is it is so crazy to me. I know a couple people that have tried to learn Mandarin and just the intonations and the different like I don't know, inflection that you have to have on basically what looks like the same thing on paper sounds really confusing. <laughs> yes, I I agree with you. I think that the intonations, the tones is is the hardest part of Chinese. Everyone focuses on the characters saying, oh, there are so many characters. Actually, I think that's okay. There is some logic in the characters. And once, and it's, you know, it's just time you spend to learn them by heart. And I, I found that okay. However, the tones, it's, yeah, it's it can be very hard to wrap your, your, your head around the tones because we don't have that in our uh, European languages. Right. Well, and is your first language French? Yes. It's, so when did French. you learn English? Because you're very good at it. I like wouldn't know that you speak French. <laughs> I, I went to an American school as a kid for a couple of years, and you know when you're when you're a kid, you you catch these language things pretty pretty easily. That's that's how I got my English. Although I'm not an English native speaker, um, as opposed to Blaine, who's the other co-founder of the channel. <laughs> yeah, that's so interesting. That's I, I think it's really interesting. Um, so what I guess I'm just asking more personal questions. What made you want to live in China for a few years? It's actually interesting. My boyfriend lived in China for a year in Shanghai. And so um, I can't imagine how different it is. Um, I'm actually going to Japan in April this year. So it'll be my first experience with I think a, a major culture shock. I went to Europe last summer and you know, it's different, but it's not as different. So what kind of sparked your interest in, in not only Chinese culture, but living there for a few years? So, uh, I, 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 my, my parents, my, my father, notably he, his studies was, um, the Chinese language. So he studied Chinese at university. And so he has this background in learning Chinese. He also put me into the whole learning Chinese thing. That's also, that's how I got an interest for Chinese very early on. And I think it's also a fascinating country, a massive economy. Uh, there's a big history. There's an interesting culture. And overall, I mean, I, I, I enjoy Chinese culture. I enjoy Chinese people. And I'm going there actually in a couple of months. I was hoping to catch a launch, but I'm not there the good month, actually. Um, and so, there, I mean, there, there are a lot of disadvantages as a foreigner living in China, um, including the fact that you have a, a rather closed internet, um, and, and uh, other reasons, but overall, I, I've had a good time and, um, it's, it's a, despite all the things that people say on China, overall, I, I enjoy the place and it can be very different to experience compared to what you, you hear from outside of China. So, yeah. um, I, I'm not pro China, anti China or anything. I just, uh, yeah, it's, I suggest people give it a shot go there on a holiday and see if you like it or not. It's China's not for everyone for sure. Um, but Hey, it's, uh, they're people and they have, they have, you know, they have their culture, their language, their society, their own worries that are actually quite similar to ours. And, um, yeah. Well, I have 
two questions that actually spur from that. Number one, you know, I'm a space journalist. Would it be just nearly impossible for me to go try and cover a rocket launch, Chinese rocket launch? Um, I think you could, I, I think you could cover it. Um, um, if it's a launch at Wenchang, it's a launch base that's much more open. Um, that's much more accessible. The other three are more military controlled. It's complicated for a foreigner. Wenchang is, is much more open and it's actually on the other side. You can, you can literally be on a beach and be five kilometers away from the launch site. How um, do you spell it? I'm going to pull it up. W-E-N-C-H-A-N-G. And uh, I'm hoping to catch a launch uh, sometime. Is it the Shiguangyin satellite? No, it's, no. it's Wenchang. <laughs> Let me type it. Um, okay. I, I, well, I typed what you wrote. Uh... <laughs> Wenchang Launch Center. Wenchang Space Launch Center. Launch. I'm just trying to pull it up on a map. Um, so... I don't know. No, it's still pulling up that Chinese satellite. Let's see. Well, actually, let me just share the map with you. Um, okay. Okay. Can you see my map? Uh, yes. So that is not it. <laughs> Although we're, we're, we're it, but we're very close. I mean, go more okay. to the east, northeast, very slightly. There's something called Lo Chiang. Yes. Chiang Okay. Yeah. Zoom on there and a little bit to the right. And now if you put a satellite view, I think that we'll see it. Oh. Yeah, you see that? That's that's yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, a bit right. lower to the left. That's that's the small village. This is basically where you'd be watching the launch. But yeah, on the lower left of your screen, a little bit more to the lower left, you'll see a tiny bit more to the left. Oh. A little bit more to the left still. There you go. That's the assembly, assembly tower for Which the long one? march yeah this what's in the, no dead center just below on the right Here? yeah those two those are the assembly towers for the long march five and seven right and here. then they're rolled out to the pad that's a little bit more to the south and you can see a third assembly center that's being constructed actually wait did i find the pad yet is this the, the pad? pad no this is the this is the the, the vertical assembly building oh. and if you go, if you go lower just keep on going lower, lower like lower, really lower. down there huh yeah that's that's where it is exactly oh wow you guys we just went to china um <laughs> i do want to i do want to add um so the second question i had is you know i asked my boyfriend would you ever want to go back to shanghai and he would but he said it's probably much different now than in 2014 and also wasn't sure if we would be safe so safe, um, I, China and, and Shanghai especially is, is, is extremely safe. It's actually much safer than a lot of European cities. Um, and I, I take Paris as, as an example. Uh, maybe he's referring to, your, to, to being a U.S. national, but I don't think that's a, an issue either. As for the difference, I haven't been in China for, for five years now, so... I'll see if things have changed. My last time was in 2019. Um, but I, I don't think so. I mean, all the COVID restrictions are now, now gone. That made definitely COVID restrictions made China a very different place. But now it's back to, um, I think it's back to normal. And But we'll see in a couple of months when I'm there. I hope that everywhere is back to normal because boy, COVID sucked, didn't it? Uh, there is no try. Thank you for the super chat, Ellie and China. I'm totally not opposed to it. Um, so yeah, maybe someday. Um, I'm thinking about maybe checking out JAXA when I'm in Japan, if possible. Uh, and that is later this spring in April. So have you been in Japan? I've yeah, as a as a tourist, I've I've never done any space stuff. Um I will be looking into the Wenchang Launch Center next time and next next time i'm in china so um i'll be able to give you any some tips yes. hopefully if you ever want to yeah. go there yes definitely i would love to you know i mean i've had press credentials at kennedy space center but i want to take it international go to the french guiana um did you like japan oh yeah i loved it spent okay. three weeks went to tokyo kyoto and some other cities i did the touristy stuff but i i find it such a, a beautiful country 
and I enjoy the food a lot. <laughs> yes, uh, I sushi is my number one, uh, <laughs> by far my favorite meal. So, well, we have some people subscribing to your channel. Your info and chats with space related goodness has been fruitful and interesting. So, um, it's been almost an hour and a half. So, I do want to say thank you so much for coordinating this with me. It's always more difficult to coordinate when we're in different countries. Um, as many of you know, I've done some streams with Marcus House, who's in Tasmania, Australia, which is oh. even crazier than Paris, France. But still, uh, I really appreciate you coming on the show. And um, sorry that I kind of put you in the hot seat, but I think you did a great job answering the questions. And it's it's really it's really interesting. And I'm glad that you're a source of information because aside from what you're putting out there for us here in the United States, I don't really know if there's any other kind of sources for us. So. Yeah. And thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to, to come on. We can, we can make this an annual thing if you want. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and I think that uh, I, this enables me also to reach out to an audience that perhaps is more focused on the U S space program. And that doesn't really know what, what China is, is up to. So I think, uh, yeah, that's, um, that, that, that's great. And, um, yeah, maybe we can do this, do this again next year. Absolutely. And congrats for, you know, your channel growing. I know that it's a, it's a nonstop grind with YouTube. So <laughs> it's, it's unimaginable and it's, it's a side gig. I actually have a full-time job in, in a job that's not linked at all to, to space. And so it's, it's, it's very challenging and um and i've actually slowed down i used to do a couple of videos a month even one video a week at some point now it's just one a month and i'm trying to more focus on on quality production value and make one sort yeah. of mini documentary a month rather yeah. than killing myself on on weekly videos when it's a side gig but i think it's working i mean that video from just two months ago has over seven hundred thousand views so congratulations yeah, that was insane. China space making 700,000 views. That's that's <laughs> incredible. And and so everyone should go watch it. Um and uh really really proud of you and who knows, maybe someday we'll be at a Chinese space launch together. That'd be very cool. <laughs> it would be cool. Um well, thank you guys so much for watching and um yeah, I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. Thanks.